All right, hello out there. Uh, this is Mike McCormick, and I've got a terrific uh, guest to speak with me today. He's been a veteran of many Hollywood films, a professional boxer, and he's currently uh, an author with a great book to tell us about. And it's just a pleasure to speak with Jack O'Halloran. Jack, how are you doing today? Doing the best I can, whatever they'll let me get away with. Oh, well, you've gotten away with quite a bit in your life, and uh, it's going to be great to talk about uh, the many highlights. So, Jack, of course, you're known for your heavyweight boxing, but you also played football. Tell us about your origins in sports and, and how you got involved with that. I played ball one year down in Western Kentucky, and I left out of my freshman year, and, and the New York Jets grabbed a hold of me and picked me up. And there was a, a league in the East Coast was like, I guess it would be like baseball's farm teams, you know? Mm -hmm. And a lot of ball players like the Christie brothers and uh, a lot of great ball players actually played in this league until so their eligibility to play up in the pros because you, you couldn't play until your college class graduated. So we, we, had, we had some pretty good ball players that played, and we played a couple games a week to keep our levels up. But when I was eligible to play, I had a lot of friends of mine down in Philadelphia, and I said to Eubank, I'd really like to get down to Philly and play for, he said, well, you got a home here, but you do what you want. You know, you, you can do whatever you want to do. So I went down to Philly, and uh, I was working out down there, and uh, they sold the team to Jerry Wallman. And Jerry Wallman brought Joe Q. Harrick on as a coach. And I watched Hugh Harrick trade a championship football team away in three months. Traded Sonny Jervison and Tommy McDonald to Washington for Norman Sneed, Irv Cross, and Maxie Vaughn to L.A. And, uh, I mean, it was just unbelievable. I just and I, I come out of a meeting one day. We come out of a, a, a football meeting one day with Tim Brown and I. And Hugh Harrick walked right by us. And Ali had just won the title. He... Um, he like almost snubbed us, and I said something to him. He turned around, grumbled something, and I said, "You know what? Take this team and stick it." And Timmy said, "While you're at it, trade me." And I think he got <laughs> traded to Baltimore, and I got involved with some people in Philadelphia who owned Liston and a few other good fighters, and I wound up in the gym and getting in shape to, to play to box. So nice. I started my boxing career. I had several fights in Philadelphia, and then I went up to Boston, and I had about 15 fights in Boston, and actually I had a lot more than that. From what I understand, you boxed from 1966 to 1974, which those are, that's some of the, hey, that's kind of the heyday of boxing when you think about yeah, who was fighting at that time. I, I fought them all. We, you know, and, and there's about 25 fights of mine that were never even registered because they, they had, Shows they used to run. Sam Silverman and and his partner ran shows all over New England. Every week they had a boxing show somewhere, Portland, Maine, and Bangor, Maine, and uh, they all over the place. So I would go. A lot of us fighters hung out together in Boston, and we would go to these fights. and And Sam Silverman said, "Oh, well, I'm short of bout, Jack. You know, would you would you mind it?" And I said, well, my management made it. Well, no, no, but we'll put you under another name. And you, you started out with quite a, a run of, of victories. Um, yeah, and I, they discovered that I had a disease called acromegalia, which is a tumor of the pituitary gland. And the doctor said, I, how do you even get in the ring? How do you get yourself? Because it causes major depression and stuff yeah. like that. And he said, how, do you, how can you fight? And I said, well, it's my day job. That's, you know, boom. So I just continued going on. I mean, I saw where you fought, like, Ken Norton, um, George Foreman. George Foreman, uh, Ken Norton, Alvin Blue Lewis, Danny McAlinden, uh, geez, Terry Daniels, Cleveland Williams. Kind of kind of a who's who. Uh, I've been a ranked fighter for about seven, eight years, and I'm in a couple of boxing hall of fames. And, um, you know, I... I I could have, if I paid attention to boxing as much as I did other things in the street, I probably would have been, uh, would have been. Uh, Ali and I were signed to fight four times. Oh, wow. 
and it just never happened. In fact, he was supposed to fight me the first time he fought Norton. We had a contract and everything. And they went to Chicago and they handed Herbert Muhammad uh, a few million dollars and Ali called me on the phone crying. He said, I, I really don't know how to tell you this, but uh, you know, I, ha- I, don't, I don't have any control over it. So we, you know, we were good friends, he and I, so. I don't know if you're aware, but a lot of those boxing matches is from the time you were you were fighting are on YouTube. Um, and I've, I watched one night, I, I, probably about eight Muhammad Ali fights in a row. I mean, they're just the, the full uh, broadcast. So it's a lot of cool stuff. Maybe I'll, I'll send you some. I want to look Ali at some was, of them. Ali was an amazing athlete, period. He would have been yeah. great in any sport he portrayed. And they... You know, when you think of Muhammad Ali, he probably would have made a great actor as well. I think he even did act in a few films. He was he, he was a good friend. I, I liked him a lot. He was uh, he was amazing. He uh, Gorgeous George, the wrestler, is the one who schooled him and said, you know, get in that mouth and off and, and dialogue and all that stuff. He said, because you'll get 50% of the people will hate you and want to see you get beat. 50% will want to see you win. So you'll own the whole crowd. So just 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 generally speaking, I mean, what what was it like going in the ring the first time? Like, were you were you kind of was the adrenaline high and you're just ready to go, or were you kind of yeah, not I, sure I, what I, to the, expect? The first fight I had, I knocked a guy out in 70, 76 seconds or something. Oh wow! And the guy was, and I remember going back into the dressing room. Was up in Reading, Pennsylvania. It was just a a preliminary four-round fight. And I remember the guy, he because I split the side of his head open, and he was screaming, well, you said this guy couldn't fight. Oh, my God, look what he just did to me. Oh, my God. Fighting boxing was a great sport. And I unfortunately, I had a lot of great talent, natural talent from it. And, and, it's, and so I, I would take fights on a week's notice and stuff, you know? Right. Because I was doing other business in different cities, and – um, and Europe and the same thing. And, you know, I, when I fought Norton, I, I they, they called me on the phone and said I was in living in New Jersey. And the, and the promoter called me up and he said, would you fight Ken Norton? I said, when? He said, next week. I said, send me a ticket. He said, you'll take the fight? I said, yeah, send me a ticket. Because we had some indictments over union problems because we were involved in uh, taking care of some union business. And um, I wanted to get out of town, so I went to San Diego, and and I trained a, a week for the fight, and I actually beat Norton. They, they, it was his hometown, and I and I stupid, I should have known. In the ninth round, the the, the crowd was standing up on the chairs. It was a great fight, and. Mm-hmm. They were screaming and crowding. When they rang the bell, they had to ring the bell four times before anybody heard it. So when they skipped, the referee separated us, and I was going back to my corner, Kenny ran across the ring and hit me behind the head and drove me into the corner. And wow. Joey Almas, the commissioner, was sitting in my corner, and he jumped up and he said, if you can't continue, you just won the fight on a foul. And I said, foul? I'm going to kill this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Very foolish. So he went out in the tenth round, and the fight went the limit. And he got a home to see, got a decision, a home decision. I stayed okay. in San Diego and knocked out a half dozen guys, and I beat Henry Clark, who nobody wanted to fight. Henry wow. was ranked like number three in the world, and he was California heavyweight championship. And I took his title away from him. Nice. I feel like boxing's just. I don't know the management of it, or it's just maybe MMA's kind of pushed it aside. But I used to love watching boxing. I just don't see it. Well, they just they don't you know boxing fighters don't fight enough. We I mean I I used to fight every other week. You know I, I loved it. You know it's just uh, I had a lot of fights in nine years, and they right. uh, it's just it's a sport that you have to stay very active in. You know and, and all the old timers. I mean I knew fighters that had 130 fights. I mean, part of uh, p- part of training was boxing. <laughs> yeah, I mean these they fought all the time unless they were cut and they had to wait for the cut to heal. But the the guys boxed all the time. You know, I, I I was in California and I had 
because of organized crime, I, they, they took my license away with this, something that turned out to be not true. And what the, they called me on the phone and they said, will you find Alvin Blue Lewis? And Alvin Blue Lewis was ranked number two in the world. He had just went 15, he went 13 rounds with Ali in Ireland. And uh, they were, he came back, he beat Ernie Terrell and another guy, and they were trying to get another Ali fight. And if he got by me, he could get a fight with Ali. And they called me on the phone and they said, will you fight Al Alvin Blue Lewis? And I said, can I get a license in, in Michigan? And they said, yeah, no problem. And I went out and, uh, and I beat Blue Lewis terrible. I beat him to death. Uh, and I won a big decision out there in his hometown. And then I went back up to Ali's camp and, uh, and, and I said that, it's time that we really got this thing on, son. And you know, and, and he was he, he's such a showman. We went into another room, into a dressing room, and and all the press and all were up there at his camp. And and we put on a show. We were kicking and punching the door. They thought we were in there fighting. <laughs> and we opened the door and Ali was laughing like hell. And That's we sat great. down to have dinner and, and I said, uh, he said to me, if I give you a title fight, are you really going to try and beat me? And I said, I'll tell you what, champ. For the first time in my life, I'll go away to camp like you guys do and train six to eight weeks. And when you come in the ring, bring a gun with you. Because you're going to need it. <laughs> nice. Two steaks, please. And we would say, he was, a, I loved Ali. Ali was a, when you talked to him one-on-one, -on -one, he was a totally different person. He was very clever. Yeah. He was definitely a showman. I mean, yeah. I mean, looking at your boxing record, I mean, you were boxing basically every other month. Yeah. In, no, for, I mean, for the most I part. Beat Mac Linda was the champ of uh, of Ireland and, and England, and and uh, Carl Gizzy was the heavyweight champ of Wales. I beat him in England, and Joe Bugner I actually beat. And they, they it was a ten round fight in Albert Hall, and they cut it down to eight because he was out on his feet. And they and they gave him a quarter of a point a quarter of a point decision, and and even the newspapers the next day had never heard of a quarter of a point decision. But I beat him pretty soundly, you know, bugger. And then they uh, and he would never fight me again either. Who was probably the the most uh, menacing opponent that you, that you came up against? Who was I your? I tell you, the guy that hit the hardest was Cleveland Williams. Okay. Cleveland Williams, I fought Cleveland Williams. They called me on the phone to fight a kid, Terry Daniels, who was uh, ranked like six or seven in the world. They were looking for a fight for Frazier. They wanted Frazier to fight somebody in, in, in the Houston Astrodome. So I went down, they called me the, the promoter for, uh, for, for, for Houston. Oh, God, was the guy was from Florida. Called me on the phone and said, would you fight Terry Daniels? And I said, sure, well, send me a ticket. So I went down and I destroyed Terry Daniels. I knocked him out in three rounds. But I was when I got off the plane, he said, "My God, you're in great shape." And I said, "Aren't you supposed to be in shape when you fight, or what?" <laughs> and, uh, and so I flew back to Philly with Yank Durham on the plane. He was down there watching the fight, and he said to me, uh, "You beat one more good fighter, you can have the Frazier fight." And I said, "You picked the fighter in the place and send me a ticket." He said, are you serious? I said, serious heart attack. You picked a fighter in the place and sent me a ticket. So they called me up a week later and said, will you fight Cleveland Williams next month in Houston, Texas? I said, absolutely. So I beat Cleveland Williams, uh, but in the third round, my God, he hit me a left hook. And I, I thank God I was in shape. He hit me a left hook. I felt it in my toes. Oh, wow. I cuffed him and spun him around and, and I whispered in his ear and I said, you're never touching me the rest of this night, son. And I gave him a boxing lesson. Uh, looks like that one went, uh, that was back September 71. Yeah. And what, from what I can tell, it looks like you went 10 rounds together. So that yeah. must have been. Well, the last guys... three rounds, I was holding him up. I <laughs> hit him a combination. He'd go to fall, I'd pick him up, and I'd say, man, don't be that falling down on me now. We've been dancing all night. And he was he was getting old at that time. And, I, you know, and, and if he got knocked out, it would have stopped his earning power and, and, and that was his living you know yeah i like cleveland cleveland was a good guy but uh, a lot of a lot of great actors uh started in oh, boxing 
Jack Palance was a fighter. Mitchum, uh -huh. Mitchum was a fighter. You, when you mention these business uh, things where you, where you need to get moved out, is that what you were doing at the time? You had well, we were doing a lot of union business with the, the iron workers and teamsters, and Jimmy Hoffa was a good friend of mine, and we we, we settled some strikes with him and stuff like that. Nice. My Which, father, uh, I had a very I had a very famous father. Right, and we're going to talk about your your father and your book uh, here in a, in a little bit, yeah. uh, Family Legacy. Which, well, I was uh, just... taking care of some family business and at the time when I was boxing, and that was, gave me an opportunity to go from state to state, and I had a day job. You know, you always had to have a day job. Oh, yeah. Boxing was a day job. So I didn't really, you know, I didn't put my heart and soul into as much as I should have. Um and if certain people were around, I probably would have been champion of the world. But uh, yeah. I never, um, I, I didn't care. I, I used boxing as a day job. It was great. And, blah, 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 blah. and I uh, and then I kicked myself in the butt afterwards because I had a lot of natural talent. And it was my, my own foolishness. You know? Was it uh, was it very lucrative at that time? No, that, that was the, I mean, I had to make money. I was making money in the street a lot more than I was. Boxing. I started boxing for ten dollars a round. Oh I wow! Mean, Ali was. I had a contract. They paid me one hundred and fifty bucks a month, a week, one hundred and fifty dollars a week to train. And uh, Ali was the one that brought money into boxing. Right. He's, he's the one that created the purses and stuff. And uh, he and I it would have been a great purse. But I mean, God, if somebody gave me a million dollars to fight, you'd have to bring a gun in the ring. <laughs> I'm um, what I tell you. Did you uh, did you spar with uh, Muhammad Ali? Never sparred with each other. We all, we talked about it a couple of times, but he said, uh, when I said to him, I said, I don't want to spar. We want to fight you. <laughs> you know, he, right, uh, right. He was, we, we were good friends. We we spent a lot of time together. He was a, he was a, he was, a, and you know his whole. His whole Parkinson's thing was was not actually what brought that on was his training camp in Pennsylvania was next to a mink farm. And they used to spray for rodents on the mink farm. And he'd be out doing his road work. And these kids from Pennsylvania did a, a, a serious blood test on him and found out that he was poisoning himself. And it broke his wow. body down. The insecticide spray that they used actually poisoned his body. Lucky he so, didn't die. Actually. So it wasn't the, the, the fighting? It was No, it had nothing to do with fighting. No. Huh. Wow. No, he was I mean he was he I remember when he was gonna fight Foreman and he said to me, Jack, what tell me about George Foreman. And I said, I think he gets tired, man. I said, you know, I got caught with a lucky punch with George. I only trained I think eight days for the Foreman fight. Uh -huh. And uh, and I had I heard him in the second round, and it was my own mistake of not following it up. In fact, you could see that fight on YouTube. It's a pretty good fight. Do you have a favorite boxing movie or a movie that you feel like best represents the sport? Wow, there's a couple. I mean, Willie Pep was a great fighter. My God, was a great fighter. But the you know the uh, the Robert De Niro fight when he fought uh, when he Raging Bull. Raging Bull was a great fight. Rec uh, you remember uh, Anthony Quinn, uh, Requiem yeah, for, for a Heavyweight? heavyweight. That's, yeah. a good, that's an underrated one. That was a good film fight. Yeah. Rocky was my life. <laughs> oh, yeah? We did Farewell, My Lovely. Stallone came out with Joe Spinell with a half dozen fighter of, of half dozen guys from New York to fill in some character roles on Farewell, My Lovely. And Stallone had a small part in the movie. And he picked my brain every day because he wasn't from Philly. And I told him about Philadelphia. I was a gangster fighter. I was a that's, hoodlum. And, that's really uh, that's really interesting because yeah, you, it was you, my life. He did, you know, like he, he we talked about the waterfront and, and the mafia and, and everything else. And he uh, and he, he he wrote he wrote and God bless him. He did well. That's all. So so just for anyone listening. So Jack went from boxing in 1975. He started 
uh, acting in his first movie he hit it out of the park with farewell my lovely and uh, the cast in that it's just stacked with some of the biggest actors of the 70s and great oh, character great actors uh, so you had like uh john ireland you had anthony zerby charlotte rampling i mean it was a brilliant cast uh sylvester Harry stallone Stan- stallone yeah harry harry dean stanton i loved him uh i, I did my screen test they when they called me up to do that movie i met the director in new york and he said uh you're the guy, you're the guy. I said, yeah, right. <laughs> so they flew me out to do a screen test in Hollywood. And, and Harry, I did the screen test with Howard Dean Stanton. And Mitchum saw the screen test. He said, it's either that kid or I don't do the movie. So That's I blame that. everything on Robert Mitchum. Well, he's certainly a cool cat. Um, and, and so, yeah, Stallone, this is before Rocky, he had kind of a, almost like a cameo or just smaller role in, in the movie. And of course, you, being a professional boxer, tell me about that. What 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 was he? What kind of questions did he ask you? What was that interaction like? He asked me all about Philadelphia and the boxing game and the waterfront, and the, and and I told him the gym, the kind of gym that I trained in, and we trained in the Pash Young gym, which was you walked up three stories of creaky old stairs. It was an old building, and they put the gym up in North Philadelphia. It was at South Philly, Pashunk, and Moore. And I told him about the trainer I had. It was an older guy who trained Giordello and some other people. Mm-hmm. And he created this uh, character that, uh, what you call played as his trainer. Burgess great Meredith, uh, Mickey. Bur- Burgess Meredith, great actor. He, he was like Ado for Taco. And he, uh, but they, you know, and he, he did, and he, he where he, the raw eggs every morning, uh-huh. Where he's cracking He got that from me, and I still do that. I've been doing that for 60 years. Okay, I eat, so... It, eat six raw eggs every morning. So it's your fault. I, I did. I tried that as a kid after watching <laughs> after watching Rocky. Oh, I did that. I, I used to... I used to... Well, I had a blender, and I put six eggs in, shells and all, and yeah. vitamins and orange juice, and I whip it up, and I drink it every day. I still do it. I do it every morning. I drop them in a smoothie uh, every now and again. But uh, yeah, I, I used to try to em- emulate that scene in uh, Rocky when I was a kid. It's hilarious, he and it's your fault. <laughs> he got he got that from from myself. That's hilarious. So, uh, farewell, my, my lovely. Uh, Dick Richards was the director. Um, and tell us about that. What was it like to, to to go straight into a Hollywood film like this? This is right after Chinatown. In well, fact, some of the crew worked on Chinatown. Um, the, the, the cinematographer was a he was an Oscar winner. He he won the Oscar for Chinatown. John Alonzo, I believe. Alonzo. Four Oscar winners. The makeup guy was an Oscar winner. Uh, the, the camera guy was an Oscar winner. The special effects guy was an Oscar winner. There were four Oscar winners on the on that picture, because wow. of Mitchum. Yeah. Because of Mitchum, and you know he, uh, Robert was an amazing individual. I mean, I, I he, he arranged for he and I to go to work the very first day. In fact, then we we wound up going to work every day together. Uh, but they they picked him up and they came and got me and I, and I remember I was staying in a hotel in Hollywood and they told me well your driver's here so I come bouncing down into the lobby and there's Mitchum standing against the wall with dark glasses on with his foot up against the wall and I wow. come down the steps and he said well this must be Jackie O and I said <laughs> yeah <laughs> so we got in the car and he I mean, he had me laughing all the way down to the set. And we got down to the set and he changed in the costumes. We, we were doing, the first scene we ever did was when we walked up into the black bar. And we were at the bottom of the steps. And he looked at me and he said, you read that script, kid? I said, read it. I said, I read your role, my role, Charlotte Rampling, Harry Dean Stanton. I said, I, yeah, cover to cover. He said, good, throw it in the trash can. I said, <laughs> what? 
He said, don't let me catch you doing what thousands of people do in this town, acting. Just be yourself. Take that character, stick him in you, and be you. Right. And that was probably the greatest advice he ever gave me. And he was, uh, and he did that to me. He technically showed me how to do this thing, you know. And very close friends, and I spent a lot of time with Robert. I loved him dearly. Wow. They don't make him like Robert Mitchum anymore. Oh man, he was. Believe me, he was. He was a. He was a trip. I mean, I went up to his house. I used to go to his house all the time. He lived in Bel Air. And I spent a lot of time with him. And I went in one day and, and, and I said, you know, the movie's about to come out and it looks like it's a pretty good film. Maybe I should get an agent. And he pointed to a phone book. <laughs> I said, Robert, what's with the phone? He said, if you think I'm going to tell you where to go and you don't like the guy and you're going to come back and get mad at me, I don't think so. He <laughs> said, phone book's full of agents, kid. So when I picked Meyer Lansky, he's a, a Meyer Michigan, he said he couldn't get a better guy. Right. Now, uh, another great thing about Robert Mitchum is he's playing the classic character Philip Marlowe, uh, made famous in hum- with hum- Humphrey Bogart, obviously, yeah. in the uh, 30s and 40s. Murder My Sweet, yeah. Yeah, Mur- Murder My Sweet. Yeah, Murder it was a, a remake yeah. of that, I believe. Just a cool, uh, Just it's just cool that, that, that he's playing that iconic character. So again, Mike you're... Mazurki did the same role that I did. Mike Mazurki, yes. Mike Mazurki was the wrestler. And uh, you were searching for your Velma. Yeah. <laughs> Where's my Velma? It's Where's my friend. Velma? What a gorgeous now, Velma. Uh, yeah, she's totally uh, channeling Lauren Bacall in that movie. Um, yeah, she was. You're right. Yeah. She's got just like a, a wicked beauty about her. I've always found her fascinating. She's it's very lovely to look lady. at as well. Absolutely wonderful lady. Now, what what what's she like? Uh, she was terrific. She was a, she was really a sweetheart. I you know, the whole cast. I mean, we just had a good time. We had a, we had a lot of fun doing that movie. Well, it's a great it's a great movie, and um, anyone that's listening that might want to watch it, I know it's on Vudu right now streaming, and it's definitely worth checking out. Again, it's one of the great movies of the seventies. And uh, I mean, I think the 70s is probably one of the best decades for film. Oh, I did from Farewell, My Love, that one did King Kong. Oh, King Kong. Now, let me tell you about King Kong and me. King Kong, the first movie I saw was Jaws. Second movie I saw was King Kong. Again, you know, you had a great cast. Charlie, Charlie Groden and Jeff Bridges and, and Jessica. You knew Jessica was a star the moment she walked on the set. And she was brilliant. I mean, she's just such a sweet lady. I mean, you couldn't ask for a nicer person than Jessica Lange. She's absolutely uh, stunning to look at as well in that movie. She was gorgeous. She was absolutely gorgeous. And the camera loved her, you know? Yes. And, and the, th- the problem was that she almost she almost uh, ruined her career because the, this, the, 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 the director and tried to make her look like too much like Marilyn Monroe, you know. And she actually didn't do her any favors. And she was going to school and stuff. And she, uh, they came to her to do uh, Postman Rings twice. When we were having breakfast at Nate and Al's one morning, she said, they offered me Postman Rings twice with Jack Nicholson. I said, do it. What are you crazy? What are you waiting for? She said, they don't want De Laurentiis involved. And he owned her contract. Oh. And they didn't want him involved. So I said, well, I said, I'll tell you what. You go down and see him in three days. Just take, tell, call him on the phone and tell him you want to see him. And she went down to see him and he um, went and got her portfolio, took her contract and tore it in half and gave it to her and said, I want to wish you all the luck in the world. And please tell your friend that I gave you this back. Oh, wow. And That's she said, what nice. did you do? I said, I didn't know. What are you talking about? She said, Jack. So he, uh, Dino was, uh, yeah, gave her a contract back. She did post him and she became a huge star. Was, uh, wow. So what was uh, what was Dino De, De Laurentiis like? He was a good guy. He wasn't a bad guy, but he, you know, he got, he listened to what I had to say and he did what I asked him to do and with him, and he gave her a contract back. And she was free and she, she became a star, boy. Well, she certainly uh, took off with that. Um, Rosemary uh, made her a star, boy. She was, she was, 
She was great. She was great in that film. She had the talent, you know, whatever she did, Tootsie with, with uh, Dustin. Dustin Hoffman. She just, she had great talent. Oh, yeah. Very se- sensual on screen. But uh, any memories of uh, Jeff Bridges? Jeffrey was a good guy. I mean, Jeffrey and I had, were, became good friends. And, you know, he was, uh, again, he got a, he's another great actor. Mm-hmm. You know, with King Kong had, I mean, Charlie Grodin's a great actor. Jeff, Jeff is a great actor. And there were a lot of uh, individual character actors that were in that film that were pretty good actors, boy, that rounded that film out. Yeah, you had uh, your your buddy uh, Bonefish, uh, the Bond villain uh, Ju- Julius Harris. Julius, Julius Harris and Eddie Louder, and uh, uh-huh. there were some good people in the film. It was, it was a long. We had a great script. It was a great script, a great cast. Just the the director wasn't that great. Um, how uh, did I'm you get involved with that? Did you have like a screen test or how did? No, they just called me up and asked me. They offered me one of four roles. Mm-hmm. And, um, and my agent, I had an agent at that time, Meyer of Michigan. And, and we took Joe Perko role and, and, it, uh, and it worked out pretty well. Renee Bergenwald was in the film, was another great actor. I mean, you, you have like, I think the first line in the movie. When you were making the movie, did you have an idea of how Kong was going to be presented? I knew it was going to be a good film because it, we did some great stuff in it, you know? Right. Did you think it was going to be a robot the whole time or a man in a suit? Well, like you only saw them together once. They only, they only actually had the monkey together, all together one time it was the there was what's his name was uh uh was in a rick, suit rick and baker rick baker did a great job i mean uh, yeah they they had the arm where jesse sat in his palm his hand and they seen different parts of the monkey but they only had the whole monkey put together at the end of the movie the only time was the whole thing was together jessica when they she was sitting in the palm of his hand and his finger was coming down and stroking her the mechanical strings broke on it and actually hit her in the head. The finger fell down on her. From what I read, there's there were like Italian guys that were doing certain effects and uh, they didn't get the the direction in English as quickly as they needed to and sometimes, you know, would put her in a lot of danger lot of in that mechanical. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's absolutely true. I mean, and they, and every time, you, you gotta understand something, Kong cost about, 38 million to do they could have done it probably for 16. sure because every time you make a mistake you and you got to come back and reshoot that's like cost you three or four times more than the original day of shooting and the, well, same, the hydraulics on the monkey kept breaking right they, they had a lot of trouble with the mechanical side of it now, i know that that movie was announced at the end of 1975 for a Christmas 1976 release was uh, was it a rushed production? Um, was it a stressful production? You know, we we we, we okay. Well, like we went to Hawaii to shoot the smoke screen. You know. Oh yeah. And the scene going through the smoke. Mm-hmm. And we went to Hawaii for three days. We were there for 33 days because the director. And we never got the smoke screen there. We shot that in Malibu. Mm-hmm. It laid the fog up in Malibu where they could control the weather better. The wind kept blowing it out in Hawaii. But we shot up in the mountains and the waterfalls and stuff like that, uh, which was great. It was beautiful. Yeah. We shot over in, uh, in, in Kauai. We shot in Honolulu Bay, which is on the other side of Kauai. And mm-hmm. the only way you could get to it was by helicopter or by walking over the mountain or by boat, yeah? So we used to fly in with helicopter. Flew in one morning and and a, and a couple were celebrating their wedding and her, at, in, in sleeping bags. And they woke up to a movie crew, which was, then they thought it was great because they got a great lunch out of it and everything else. And they got oh, yeah. Jeffrey and, and Jessica and it was terrific. But there was, a, it, the scenery in Hawaii was gorgeous. My God! But then the Great Wall, that was on the back lot of MGM. Now, what was that like? That that set looked huge, and I, it's amazing when you think about how many people probably worked to build that. 
Was it as large in person as it appears oh, yeah. on screen? It's gigantic. They built it on the back lot of MGM, which is a housing project now. It was it was a great. We had a lot, we had a lot of time. We worked on that film for nine months. That was a long shoot. Well, I, I think it's a great movie, I, and it's actually gone on 4K. It's it's uh, I, it came out at a time when I think remakes weren't in vogue or sequels, not like not like they are now anyway. Yeah. And so everybody kind of thought, oh, what are they doing messing with this classic? But but it, I think it's a classic in and of itself, and it's in got itself. a, it's a, a classic huge, in itself. Yeah. it's got a huge growing fan base, and a lot of people that subscribe to my channel uh, love the King Kong movie. It, it's just been there my whole life, and uh, it's always just been fun. The casting, uh, the director, the casting people came up to me, and the writer and say, God, we wasted a great talent you have for, we should have had a better role for you. That's still a great, you're, you're memorable in it. Um, definitely memorable. Again, you have the first line in the movie. Oh, you even got to carry the skyline from the life raft into the boat. That had to have been, you know, not the worst job in the world. <laughs> Gorgeous, yeah. One thing I remember about you the most of course is is your demise you're in that classic log scene what was that set like what was it like filming that that was the last that was the last shot of the film that's that was the last thing that we shot that was at the mgm esther williams pool um, wow when they shot that that scene it was uh that was great you know it, it was it, it was very traumatic a lot of a lot of very good traumatic scenes in that film that they did well, you know? Right. The director, I'm sure he was under a lot of stress and whatnot, being in charge of all of that and having Dino De Laurentiis probably. Dino's son was the executive producer. Frederico De Laurentiis, yeah, I believe his name was. What a nice kid. He's the one that died. He was a nice kid, boy. I like yeah. him. Yeah. And he and Gilman just didn't get on. You know, he, he was snotty to a lot of people, but, you know, he, he, um, we were working in Kauai and it was hot and, and he would have a bot, a cooler with beer in it and he had a lock on it and, and no one else was allowed to drink beer at lunch or anything else, just him. So I one day brought like several cases of beer down for the crew and said, on the lunchtime, I said, have a drink, man, how was it? We were in, in Kauai and we worked on a Sunday. Now, you're on location. So you're already on golden time, yeah? And we yeah. worked on a Sunday, and we worked 15 straight hours. We had eight straight meal penalties. Or if you if you go beyond, if you're supposed to have a break time for your meals, and if you go a minute beyond, there's one meal penalty, another half hour, another half hour. You know, we had eight straight meal penalties and never turned over a camera. But John was so adamant that he was going to get this fog scene laid down and they kept telling him the, the, the island people said you're never going to get that shot today because the currents the winds are just never going to let it settle it's going to keep blowing out wow so we wound up shooting it in Kauai I mean in uh, Malibu I do like the uh talking about direction I do like the 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 scene that introduces Kong I think that's really well done in, in the in the in the 76 um well, there was a lot of there was a lot of great great scenes in the movie I mean, john john wasn't a total disaster he was talented but he just didn't um i never well, had I, the other people did well i appreciate you enduring that shoot because i love that movie and what and tell me what it was like like once you've made this movie this is your second film um, and the hype behind that movie. They were trying to outgross Jaws, and there were ads everywhere. Time Magazine did a cover story on it. What was it like just being a part of that? Was it, it was, How exciting was that? Or did you just kind of move on? It, 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 you know, it's just uh, my career, just one film after the other after that. You know, it was, just, uh, it was, it was good. I mean... I made a few mistakes, so I turned down a couple films. I turned while we were doing Kong, we had six weeks off because they went to New York to shoot the New York stuff, and the last scene we did was the log scene. So we sat in California waiting for them to come back, 
and they offered me uh, the movie with uh, uh, the comedy with uh, uh, Silver Streak. Oh, okay. Gene Wilder, and, and and they were going to let me go for the six weeks, and I'd come back and finish King Kong, but I had six weeks to go up, and I, I should have done it. I It was a mistake I, I made. I should have went up to Seattle and shot the movie and come back down and finished Kong. But I didn't, so, you know, it was just that. Well, I mean, it kind of had to have been overwhelming to just be in that situation so early because you're doing well, two I, it, huge Hollywood first, movies. first mistake I made in my career was that when I did Farewell, My Lovely, Mitchum and Carson were very close. So mm-hmm. Robert said to me, Johnny Carson wants you to do a show and I want you to you should go and do it and he'll get you nominated for Supporting Actor. But I, Farewell, My Lovely came out pretty good. Oh yeah, and, uh, and, and I met Carson at the Polo Lounge, and and he said, uh, you know, if you come on my show, he said I'll get you nominated. For I think he did a great job in Farewell, My Lovely. I love the picture, and Mitch uh, Mitch loves you, and you know so. And I, and I said, and his show was live at the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And oh, I said, it was huge. The Tonight yeah, Show. That's it was it was a live show. It wasn't taped. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Sure. So I said to him, I said, you do a live show, don't you? And he said, yeah. I said, oh, I don't think I can do it. He said, what What are you talking about? I said, well, I'm going to come out on the school on your, on your set. You're going to ask me about my father, and I'm going to ask you where the men's room's at. He said, you would get up and leave? And I said, yeah, I don't talk about my father. And I didn't. And that was very foolish, you know. And he said, well, we'll, 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 we'll gear the, the, the answers to questions to ask you. I said, John, no disrespect, but you're the greatest news reporter in the business today. And you have Albert Anastasia's son sitting on your set, and you're not going to ask me about my father when no one talks about Albert? And he shook his head. He looked at me. And then Mitchum screamed at me. He said, are you crazy, man? This is Hollywood. They love that kind of stuff. They eat it up. And it was foolish. I should have done it because I probably would have got nominated for Farewell, my lovely, for a supporting actor. Wow. You've got stories where you're hanging out with Robert Mitchum and Johnny Carson. That's not too bad. <laughs> well, I, John was a nice guy, man. And Robert, I loved Robert. He was like a father. He, he and I became very close. From King Kong, uh, I know you were offered the uh, another Richard Keel part, um, Jaws from Spy Who Loved Me. That's um, amazing. You know, I... I turned down five pictures that Richard did made his career. <laughs> oh, my goodness. He asked me, Cubby Broccoli flew from London to L.A., him and his son. And I, I was uh, sitting around the corner in a restaurant with Mitchum. It was his birthday. And I was gay. We were having lunch. And I said, Bob, I have to go around the corner. Cubby Broccoli sitting at Meyer's office, and I've got to go say hello to this guy. And he said, "What for what? I said, they want me to do this James Bond picture, or Jaws. And he said, uh, you like the script? I said, not really. He said, well, then th- tell him to go to hell. I said, I said, well, I got to go around and say something to these guys. So I had already signed to do a picture called March or Die with Gene Hackman and Catherine Deneuve and Terrence Hill and, and a couple of good actors. So I went around the corner and I and I met them and I said, hello, how are you? Ba-bing, ba-bang. And, and Meyer said, that, well, he's already signed to do a picture. And they they tried like hell. They wanted to buy me out of the other picture. And I said, well, I'll just talk to my agent. And I left. I wouldn't give him a definitive answer. I just left. And what Meyer did said, you... Uh... What what did you not like about the script? Was it kind of like play, I didn't want to get into playing big dumb guys, you know? I uh, I didn't want to get into caught up in that genre. You know what I'm saying? You wanted uh, to go more with Farewell My My Lovely yeah, kind of Farewell My Lovely and 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 I did uh, Kong and then I did The Baltimore Bullet, which was a pretty good movie with Jimmy Coburn and Omar Sharif. Yeah, yeah, I actually uh, I actually watched last night uh, March or Die. March of Die wasn't a bad film. What, what the problem with March of Die was, they they did a four-hour version. It was like cut on, on television, two hours and two hours. And the four-hour version was terrific. But when you cut 
an hour and 40 minutes out of four hours, you, you're chopping the movie up pretty good. But that that movie uh, was epic. It's got it's got Terrence Hill. Uh, oh yeah, Terrence Hill Max is a Hunt. huge Italian actor. First movie he ever did uh, in English. Yeah, reminded me Hackley, of uh, Catherine Deneuve, uh, Max Pazuffi. There were some great actors in that, in that, in that film. Yeah, Terrence Hill kind of reminded me of it. It's kind of like a, a Steve McQueen type role. Yeah, Terrence is a good guy. Yeah, you know, he did all his own stunts. Remind me of the the Sand Pebbles a little bit that movie, just the tone of it. And uh, but the uh, battle at the end of that movie is huge and very oh, uh, very sweet. intense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it just like I, and I I did notice it did seem like the movie was truncated a little bit because it gets intense real quick there at the end. Well, if you <laughs> seen if you saw they have a television version where it's like I said it's four hours long, and that oh. and that was uh, that's epic, but. That's Lou Grade, boy. He was a trippy guy. And the money made, they made money off of the film because they pre-sold Germany because of Turn. Turns Hill was a huge actor in, in Europe. He did those yeah. spaghetti westerns. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, they paid like $8 million for the rights to show March or Die in Germany alone. Oh, wow. So they made their money back pre-selling the film. They were you know, there was uh, Lou Gray was a, kind of a trippy guy. King Kong kind of had that when NBC showed it. They basically paid for the budget of that movie just to be able to show it two or three times, from yeah. what I understand. That's exactly uh, correct. Um, but uh, March or Die, if anyone hasn't seen that, uh, there's a copy of it on YouTube. It seems to have a distribution issue in the States anyway. Uh, I find it odd that a movie with Gene Hackman wouldn't have you know more wide distribution because I, I honestly until I started looking in you know to your your filmography I didn't know anything about that movie and yeah, if I knew about it I would have watched an it epic movie you're right it was a, it was an epic movie the, the scenes in Morocco were were incredible and 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 we wound up finishing it in Arizona because Hackman got hurt and fell off a horse and so they had to put us off for a few months and and we were back and they finished the last scenes in, in Arizona. But I love the arc in, in March or Die of uh, you and uh, Terrence Hill's character. Um, Terrence Hill's kind of jokey and nonchalant about everything. And then at the end, he's after that battle, he's kind of gristled like Hackman's character. I, I thought that was really cool, the way that worked out. And of course, yeah. you're fighting. You've got like eight guys with swords hanging on your arms and you're fighting them off. Uh, man, I, I just really love the uh, the fight. Uh, the French accent, they should have been there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's one reason I'm a, I'm a little groggy here because I stay. I kept going, I'm just going to watch a little bit of this and I kept watching it and watching it. So uh, it was really engrossing. Uh, I'm going to have to tell my dad to watch that. He loves uh, war movies. It was actually uh, a good film. It actually was very well shot. The cinematographer was a great cinematographer. Ian Holmes in it, another great actor. Yeah, no, Ian um, Holmes in it, Marcel Brzezuki. There were some great actors in that film. Really something else. Um, and, a, and another movie, before we get into the, the Superman, The Baltimore Bullet that you mentioned with James Coburn and, and Omar, uh, Omar Sharif. Sharif. Yeah, uh, my God, my God. That, uh, that, that movie seems like it, when it came out, it was a big... First film. What was that? Bruce Boxleitner, that was his first movie. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, that's one movie that I've got saved that I'm going to watch, but it looks it looks fun. And, and it's another movie that just doesn't seem to have that uh, distribution in the, in well, the they States. They didn't distribute it. The AFCO Embassy ran out of money. It was never distributed properly. And they actually shot the nine ball tournament at NGM that year. We had all the great pool players of the, of the world were in the film. Yeah. They shot the nine ball tournament right down at MGM that year. So was Minnesota Fats there and Fats was there. Guys from oh there was a dozen of them that some of the great pool sharks. I've seen some movies that were made by Robert Ellis Miller who who, who directed that. Nice and guy. He made a movie called Hawks that that's a real good movie if you yeah. ever were you ever approached because you you seem to be Richard Keel was on your heels. Were you ever approached about playing the Hulk? They came to me when we were doing Superman to do the Hulk. 
Oh, wow. They came to me first to do Conan. They wanted me to do the Conan movie. And the guy, the guy begged, oh my God, he spent four or five days. And, and I said, man, I, I don't want to be lifting weights and all that stuff every day. Was you that know? John Melius? John yeah, Melius? wanted me to bulk up and stuff like, because I was pretty well built, you know, from, from boxing and playing football and stuff. And, and, and the structure was there. And they just wanted me to pump up, you know? Sure. And I just, I, and I should have done it. I actually should have done it. But we were hooked into a long period of time with Superman. Superman was like a three-year film. If you were on set for Spy uh, Who Loved Me, you could have somehow shifted things to where you couldn't have gotten involved with Superman. So I guess ultimately it all worked yeah. out. Yeah, you, you would have crossed, it would just cross schedules. It would not work. One film that I turned down that Richard did that I kicked myself for not doing was Pale Rider with uh, Eastwood. Oh, yeah. And I just, uh, I should have done that. I was doing something, I forget what I think. I don't know whether it was Dragnet or something. I was doing another film. Me and a friend uh, took Richard Keel out to dinner. And, this uh, guy, Richard was a good guy. And he, and he yes. suffered from Acromigli as well. He had the same yes. disease. In fact, he killed him. He never got it. I had the tumor taken out at the Mass General Hospital. I saw him around 2007. I went and I picked him up at one of these comic comic cons. Oh, um, yeah. And I actually, we, me and a, a friend drove him that I worked with on this Jaws documentary. We thought it'd be cool to interview Jaws about Jaws. So we went and we, we told him we, we'll take him to the best seafood restaurant in town, which was Chesapeake's. This is in Knoxville, Tennessee at the time. And we, we went and met him there. And we took him to this nice restaurant, and my my parents have this house about an hour away. But we didn't really get into that. It was an hour away. But we we went we picked him up, and there was a moment when we were driving him. We we're going out in the hills, and we're out in the country. And he actually looked at me. You know, you talk about you know the mafia and whatnot, and the the crime crime lords. And he looked over at me. And he said where are you taking me? <laughs> like, I think he actually, <laughs> there was a moment of silence where he actually was like, who are these people and where are they taking me? Well, every movie that you made, it has an interesting cast or, or there's a, just so much behind the, these movies that you made. They're, they're basically some of the, biggest movies coming out of Hollywood during during this this time frame and you're with some of the biggest actors or the iconic actors. actors. I work with a lot of premium actors. So it's a it's a huge list, that's for sure. Moving into what a lot of people know you you for. And yes, it's great that you were non, but uh, anyone listening that hasn't seen any of these other movies that we were talking about, I hope you'll check Jack out in them because he, he's just a great uh, screen presence. And of course, that's I friend, exhibited uh, none better than, uh, of course, Superman. Supported statement. And I tell you that we must evacuate this planet immediately. Jor-El, there was a civilization. Tell us about how that came about. The marcher died, the and they got a hold of Gene and I, and, and flew us up to London to meet Richard Donner, and uh, and they offered me the character Non, and and Richard said to me. Uh, how do you feel about playing a deaf mute guy? And I said, I embrace that. He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, Jackie Gleason was a friend of mine and he won an Oscar doing Jigo. If I ever got an opportunity to play a character like that, where I had to use facial and body, you know, emotion, I would embrace it. And Nan was a perfect character because you had Zod was a, was, was a vicious general. Sarah was a man-eater. And somebody had to relate to the kids because Superman was a movie for kids, you know? So sure. I'd, I'd take this big hulk of a man and play him like a child. Right. It's almost and like it, Frank, almost like uh, how Boris Karloff played Frankenstein in a yeah. way. It actually worked out very well. It actually, it actually worked pretty good. I mean, I've had, remember the first Comic-Con I ever did and uh, somebody came up to me and they said, my God, you can actually speak? <laughs> and, I, and they said, but 
your character scared the death out of me, but I loved the character so much because children related to to Nan, and it worked out pretty good. Well, that's some of your some of your best villains. You care for them. You don't necessarily agree with what they're doing. So when you know you see them getting their, you know, just desserts, like like say when Nan's getting. I remember as a kid being worried about you, as Superman's you know putting that tower on top of you. And uh, I remember having empathy for your character, being more worried about your character than what Superman was doing. And yes, that of course I was a little kid watching that and totally connected with uh, what you were doing there. And obviously a whole generation of, of people uh, connected with your character. Yeah, they, yeah, no, they well, actually did, you're right. The whole thing with Richard Donner, Richard Donner seems seemed like he was just at the peak of his powers during Superman. I know it's unfortunate that the producers kind of... Let me tell you, what they did, and the Saul Kinds were so foolish because Richard would have done 10 Superman, okay? In fact, right. that was the original thing. They were going to do 10 films. And he was he lived, eat, and slept it. He and Mankiewicz were so much into those films and they, they brought Lester on because they owed him a picture and they didn't want to pay Donna. The same as, how do you cut Marlon Brando out of a movie? They cut Marlon Brando out of Superman 2 because they didn't want to pay him the points. I mean, and they had already invested so much money into him. Brando made $4 million to work for 11 days. There was a funny story where they were all having, they, they were working about a week or eight days or something like that. And they were all having dinner. And Marlon made a, made a statement. He said, well, you know, God, guys, you know, we're really working hard here. He said, uh, and, and tedious. He said, maybe we should take a day off. And, and Donner, like, said, well, yeah, you know, and, and they're kicking Donner under the table because they needed to get Brando on tape to get the money. They needed to complete Brando on tape so they could go to a bank in Italy and get the money to finish the movie. And Brando, so they said, Pierce Banger said, to him, oh, no, Marlon, the, it costs far too much money for us to, to lose a day. And Brando said, how much does it cost for day shooting? And they said, oh, God, you know, like 375000 And Brando said, well, let's take a day off. I'll pay. <laughs> Wow. They almost had a heart attack. Oh, my God. They had to talk about it, that one for sure. But they, Marlon Brandon was brilliant. He was just a, just a, an incredible individual. He, was, he reminded me of Mitch. Was he as eccentric as they let on? Was he just toying with people because he, he was well aware so, of who he was? He was so talented. I mean, you're talking about a talented, talented man, okay? He reminded me of Mitchell because when he walked on the set, you could hear a pin drop. Right. And he said good morning to everybody and he said good night to everybody. And that's what Mitchum used to do. You know, it was the, it, the, the old pros were great. And Brando was, was magnetic. And we sat down. I went up to watch him work one day and he was doing a shot. And he had cue cards everywhere. <laughs> and I said, I said, man, what's with these cue cards? Because he did that when our scene with him, we had the rings around us and stuff. And he said, I, he said, no, I said, you that bored with the industry, man? He said, no, 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 no. He said, Jack, I started that with Mutiny on the Bounty. Uh, I just didn't want the camera to make it look like I, I had studied a script or anything. I wanted to make it look like I was taking the words right out of the air. And I looked at him, I said, man, you are so full of shit. <laughs> and he, he turned around and he, and he ripped off, like he was a great Shakespearean actor. And he ripped uh -huh. off several parables of Shakespeare. And he said, that you must know word for word. This stuff, piece of cake. That's just the way he was. I mean, he was uh, he was eccentric as hell. He was, but he was so, he lost a lot of weight to do Superman. He, yeah, he, after, I guess after making all that money, he put it, put, put it back on for Apocalypse Now. <laughs> oh my God, he was huge in Apocalypse Now. He was so big, they couldn't actually shoot him in certain scenes. They, they have him in the dark quite a bit. Yeah. Um, oh, he was huge. But uh, 
he lived up he lived up in, on Mulholland Drive on the, like a little inlet. His house was across the street from Nicholson's house. And they did uh, they did that, that western together. Jack was stoned on coke every day and Brando was not happy about it. Because he was clean as a whistle. He, Brando was a pure actor boy. He just he was just he was incredible. I, I, I really had a lot of time for Marlon. He reminded me of Mitchum. He was a Mitchum said to me, you know, when you when you go down there and set and tell him I said hello. And he <laughs> and he knew my father. Brandon knew my father because he's a New York guy, you know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. Yeah. He couldn't when I walked down and set to see him when he arrived, he broke away from the press guys and ran right over to me. He hugged me and how you doing, kid? Bob, I've been dying to meet you and and, he, and we became pretty good friends. From what I've read about your father, and again, we'll, we'll we'll get into the nuts and bolts of it when we talk about family legacy, but like he, your father was kind of the forebearer of the godfather, yeah. Yeah, well, when Brando, the, the line that Brando, when they approached him to, to do the drug business, uh -huh. and he said, if we touch it, our children will touch it, it'll be the downfall of the family, my father said that. My right. father wouldn't go in the drug business, and my father control all the docks of, the, of America. Wow. And he said, uh, we're not bringing that shit in on my watch. We didn't sign up for that. I mean, that's a critical point, watching The Godfather when he says that line, because that totally, you know, you empathize with the family more and appreciate more, a little bit more, you know, what he's, what they're trying to do. He, he just was, Albert was totally against it. And he, he's, that's why they assassinated him. He killed him because he, he just wouldn't he wouldn't play the game. And they the night before he was shot, the uh, Carlos Marcellus and Cesar Trapconti were at the same hotel that he got killed in. They were at a meeting that night in that same hotel in the Park Sheraton. And he um, they begged him, Albert, it's only business, please. And <laughs> he said, No, 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 not my kind of business. Wow. Hooking us back to, to Superman, and uh, tell me how adorable was Margot Kidder? Oh, she was a sweetheart. I like Maggie a lot. She was just, she's such a talented woman. She was, she was uh, crazy. But <laughs> she seemed like uh, at the peak of her powers then, you know, just a firecracker and, and just very well, she, charismatic. I loved her, you know, she, she had, she was a great talent. She, Mar Margot really had a great talent. She just got messed up in, in, in life a little bit, you know, married to some bad people and um, she got into drugs and, and, and it, was, it was sad, but she cleaned herself up at the end. You know, at the end of her life, she, she, she got, she was an advocate for women and an advocate against drugs and, and the Indians and stuff. And, and I think that's what killed her actually. She was at a, she was at one of those uh, sit-ins and they sprayed something on the people to move them. And I think that's what infected her lungs and killed her. Oh, goodness. She was, Margot was, a, was just a neat lady. I, I liked her quite a bit. What also made Superman 2 in particular interesting is just the, the fleshing out of the villains and seeing Superman up against, you know, yourself and uh, Terrence Stamp and... Uh, Sarah Douglas. Uh, Sarah, the, Sarah was brilliant. Sarah, she was young, and it was her first really big film, boy. And, and you could tell she was going to be a hell of an actress. And she, and she's just, she's a dear friend still today. I mean, Sarah and I talk all the time. She had a, a striking look to her as well, oh, kind of like yeah, a Charlotte gorgeous. Rampling kind of thing going on. Sarah was absolutely gorgeous. And what was uh, Terrence Stamp like? Terrence was one of the... Biggest actors in England in his life, and he, he, his brother was the manager of of uh, of the of the Who, the singing group the Who. Terrence got caught up in sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and then he went to, and he went to India and he got rolfed and and spiritual and he cleaned his whole act up, and they reached out to him to do Superman, so that was the first clean move that he did, totally clean and stuff like that, you know. I heard that he uh, uh, in like he was in character like all the time. Is that true? Or like you guys kind of hung out as a as like a 
a gang almost. Is that true? Oh, uh, Terrence, Terrence was, a, was a great actor. He could turn it on and off. Oh, okay, okay. So that's just... Dude, Terrence, Terrence was a great actor. He was, he was, like I said, he was one of the most brilliant actors in, in, uh, in, in, in the English, in the English uh, acting realm. He was younger. He was, what a handsome guy he was, man. He was uh, totally cool in that role. That's for sure. As as uh, how memorable. Um, and then, then you're you're are you you just bumping into Gene Hackman again, or were you just like, did you guys know when you were doing uh, March or Die that you're going to see each other on Superman? Oh yeah, we flew up together to to talk about the film. Then we went back to finish March or Die. We knew we were going to we were going to do Superman. Um, I think he's a writer now too. He's, he's a writer. He, he's, he's retired. Mm-hmm. You know, he doesn't come out much anymore. I think he lives in New Mexico now. Yeah. I just love uh, him and like French Connection and so many Very great movies. Very talented man. Just a real, a real talented actor. He seems like he's no nonsense, too. Well, he was. I mean, we, I remember we were doing March, we were doing March or Die and uh, he, he, uh, the director wanted to do, he said, listen, don't think I'm coming out here and be like a chess set that you move around. You do your homework, you get things done the way you want us to do it, and I'll walk on a set and do it. And I'll be back in my trailer until you get that sorted out. See you later. <laughs> he turned out to be a really good comedic actor, too. But well, yeah. I mean, him and he never Didi, would have thought that. He and Med Didi were great together. And Valerie. Valerie, Valerie was... Perrine. Yeah. Now she was considered for King Kong. Yeah, but she was she was no Jessica Lange. Trust me. I know, I know. I always thought that was interesting though. So Christopher Reeve. How was working with Christopher nice Reeve? Kid, you know, but he was young. It was it was the first big thing he ever did. And you know, he should he should have sent thank you cards to Richard Donner every day. Richard mm-hmm. Donner got a performance out of that kid that no one else would have gotten that. And nobody will ever be another Superman Clark Kent performance like him. He just did Superman and Clark Kent so perfectly. Richard Donner did that. Well, Richard Donner is certainly, you know, obviously one of the one of the great directors of the past oh, quarter century or so. The guy was I mean they took when 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 he came on the set, Chris, he was hundred and seventy pounds soaking wet. Mm-hmm. Yeah? And the guy who did Darth Vader, oh God, what was his name? David Martin. Prowse. David Prowse. David was going to build him up. And I said to David, you don't want to pump this kid up with a lot of pump muscle. You want to you want to do like they did with Steve Reeves when he was Mr. America. You want to cut him because he's an ego kid. He, the kid's got a big ego. And he's not going to wear anything underneath that costume. And, and if you just put, so they put 20 pounds on him and defined his body. Yeah. And it worked terrifically. He, he looked great and he, you know, and he, he just, he, but he played Clark Kent so well in comparison to what he was with Superman. He shifted characters brilliantly. And that's Richard Donner. Richard Donner did that. You see Chris in other movies, like somewhere in time, he's very stiff. No. I will tell. I will say this about Somewhere in Time. Just as a musician myself, the score to that movie, who, John Barry, who did the score to King oh, Kong. John Barry was John Barry is a great. You're talking about a great musician. I I can listen to his soundtracks just in the background oh, and and not think of the about, movies. You're talking about some talented people here, my friend. As far as Christopher Reeve, any particular did did he was he in character all the time as Superman? <laughs> Christopher, Christopher, like I said, he was young, and it was the first big role we did. You know, and he, I mean, Mark McClure was a nice kid. He was a young kid as well. Uh huh. And playing Jimmy Olsen, and and he played the guitar. Mark's Mark's a pretty good musician. And just for an instance, you know, Christopher came into his room one day, and and and, and Mark said, "Wow, oh, you got to listen to this new tune, man." And he had the audacity to turn around and say, don't talk to me like unless you're going to talk like Jimmy Olsen. You know, that's unfair. You know what I'm saying? So I like yeah. fractured the kid a little bit. 
slight incident that, that I had with me. There was a, a great restaurant in London, the Italian restaurant that uh, is one of the biggest paparazzi restaurants uh, in, in London today. It was just starting out. It was the first Italian restaurant, the San Lorenzo on Beach and Place. Uh -huh. and it was owned by a friend of mine. I knew the people from Italy that owned it. And so I, you know, pumped it up a lot. A lot of the cast and everybody used to go and have dinner in there. And so did a lot of other actors and, you know, musicians at all became a very big paparazzi place. And they were all in there having dinner one night. And I used to go in because yeah, I lived down the street at Canuggan Square. So I used to eat my dinner every night there by myself. I just like feeling it. And they were all up in there one night and Christopher's talking about my father in New York and all. Uh -oh. And the owner called me on the phone and he said, Jack, how well do you know this Christopher Reeve kid? And I said, I, I, I've been working with him. That's all. I don't know him all that great. Well, I was just working with him. He said, well, he's in here talking about a lot of things I don't think he should be talking about. Uh -oh. and, uh, so the next day I, I, I grabbed him in the morning and I took him in a room and I said, you know, how well do you know me, young man? He said, well, we know we work together. I said, yeah, but I said, uh, next time you mention my name, put Mr. in front of it. And if you ever mention my father's name again, you won't be doing any more movies. And he, he said, you know, he could. So we were okay, boom, boom, boom. As soon as we get out in the hallway, where there's a lot of people and everything, all of a sudden he becomes Superman. And <laughs> he said to me, oh, no. He said, you can't talk to me that way. Who do you think you are? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, my God. I said, what did oh, you God, say? I grabbed him, put him against the wall, and I was just about to smack him. And Richard Donner jumped up in my ear, and he said, not in the face, Jack. Not in the face. Oh, no. So I, I dropped him on the floor, and I looked at him. I said, you know, kid, you just got the greatest pass you ever had in your life. And, and you know, and then it was over. And we, and we became, you know, friends working together. When you work with people for three years, you can't help but, you know. Oh, yeah. Pressure. And everybody's under all sorts of pressure. Yeah. And so uh, he was just a young. Made such a big thing about, oh, my God, now I was going to kill Superman. Oh, Jesus. I'm amazed. Said, well, what about this big argument you had with Christopher Reeve? Uh, it was just a, it was a misunderstanding that was straightened out. And it was never talked about again. Maybe there was just uh, the script was just playing out subconsciously <laughs> a little bit. Uh, but of course, Christopher Reeve is iconic in the role, and you're iconic as one of his adversaries. And uh, y you know, when you, you talk about the other Superman movies uh, after Donner, I, I don't understand why we can't have Superman these days like well, this. We're, the, doing, um, we're, we're putting together a project now, and we want to bring back Christopher and the three villains in hologram. Oh, wow. And it's a great storyline. I mean, we're we're going to, there's another planet on the other side of the galaxy from Krypton. That's a sister planet to Krypton. And the people on it are relatives of jor -El. And they've watched all this thing happen and all that, but they have greater technology than Krypton did. And they have this great technology that they can move through time instantly. And they have a technology to change people's thinking process. And they come into the prison and they change our villainism into good guys to where we become cohorts of Superman. Oh, wow. Well. Helping fight against all these invasions from different planets on Earth. And we go back to the all American way of not killing, not having superheroes killing everybody, like the bad guys. You know, right. And they're going to, and not even have to lock them up, but to change their whole mindset and send them back to their planets with a different thinking mind, you know? Is that going to be like through uh, DC animated well, studios? Well, we're I'm not animated. We're going to do this like a, like a major film, which we're having a bit of a tussle because Warner Brothers has been turned over. Like now it's owned by Discovery. The, That's right. Four different owners in the last couple of years. And they just put, uh, oh, I forget the, the guy's name in charge, the guy who does the... Uh, James Quinn and, and this other kid. James Gunn, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gunn, yeah. Yeah. Gunn, yeah. 
we're reaching out to people to get we want to get the, the the license we don't even want their money we we have the money to do it we just want a license and but, and we're going to develop and you put christopher back on the screen people will go crazy right it's got to be the classic superman they they've had trouble because they don't do the classic well, darker they've gotten away from the original superman thing you know they, Truth, they, justice the american way yeah they gotten away from it you got to do that You're and dark, uh, darker so we want to bring that all back you know bring the three villains and 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 and, and they're gonna they're gonna have the heal love this they're gonna have the ability to reverse my lobotomy because nam was a major scientist before they lobotomized him if you read the comic books he was a major scientist and then they lobotomized him because he was involved with zod and the first words i ever say are going to be Zod, kneel before Nan. <laughs> that would be great. That would be classic right there. Just making those, making these movies, uh, do you have any memories of, you know, making those great fight scenes? Um, it, was, it was brilliant. I mean, we had so much fun. And, and what people don't understand is that there's no wires. We, we were in body molds. And they shot us vista vision on vista vision. He shot us into the film. We had big, it was a big 70 foot screen with, with these pole arms that come out with body molds on the end of them. And we had uh -huh. movements where we could move like we were flying here, flying around buildings, under bridges. And the fight scenes were brilliant. I mean, were the, uh, did you find that the effects had evolved greatly from when you made King Kong to, to Superman? Oh my God, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the Saw kinds actually bankrupt these poor guys. They had, they had the original LED theory. They were shooting Vista Vision on Vista Vision. And it meant like we did the, the fight scenes and all with no wire. We were flying under around buildings, underneath the bridges. It's the, I love the effects back then, both with Kong and with uh, Superman, just because the, I guess they refer to them as practical effects, obviously, but 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 it's fun to watch them and try to uh, figure out the ingenuity behind the effect. Versus now, where everything's just kind of done the same way with the computers and CGI. Hey, we didn't use CGI in Superman. It was Vista Vision on Vista Vision, and that's what led into LED on LED. And so we could bring, we could come back in hologram and shoot this with LED and you would never, you'd swear we were there. Right. You know what I'm saying? I just don't think, they don't make them like they used to. I'll just say that. Well, um, it's, it's coming around. The, the LED on LED is, is, is going to revolutionize a lot of it. But of course, any final thoughts about Superman? Um, anything? We just, we had, I mean, it was a great, great cast. We had a great time doing it. Richard Donner was just, he was so brilliant to work with. It was incredible. What was it like with when Richard Lester came in? Was that kind of grading on, on the well, casting crew? It, you know, it, it was like, it's, it's like going from a college professor to a kindergarten teacher. See, we had already shot 80 some percent of the film. That's why the Donner Cut came out. And Donner Cut, have you ever seen the Donner Cut? Oh yeah, yeah, I've got Donner that. Cut is much better than I think it is anyway. But the um, the uh, the Lester cut for in order for Lester to put his name up as a director, he had to shoot at least fifty percent of the picture. So they went back and reshot stuff. That's the Eiffel Tower. It was raining so hard that day that if you really looked at those scenes with the Eiffel Tower, you'd see the policeman who was stopping Margot spots of water going on his shirt he must right. have changed his shirt six times um Lester wouldn't stay there two extra days to get the shot properly he just went ahead and shot it anyway because what he did was he he shot up with an open lens so he could go back in the laboratory and play, make it look like it was sunshine that day oh okay if you look at the cop car behind the policeman that's in, that's talking to margo the windshield wipers are going like boom, 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 boom. Yeah, I think I remember what you're talking about there. 
but like the uh the the don it would have been nice to see the donner the fully realized version i mean we did scenes where we were we didn't die at the end we were carted off in the in the police cars taken off to prison because when we went in that box our, our powers got reversed and they take us out of the abyss and put us in the in the police cars and take us away so you all didn't originally fall into that foggy we fell into a foggy thing but they we they took us out of there and put us in in the police vehicles and oh them. okay okay they shot those scenes oh that'd be interesting to see yeah, it's just very inter- very odd that, uh, you know, because the first Superman worked so well. It seemed like everything, it was making tons of money. Why would you stop working with a director that's doing well, such a good job? Go. There you go. They were just, they were very greedy people. Wow. And they took the money, they, they just, uh, Alexander, Alexander lived on an island off of France. He wasn't even allowed in the country. He was, they were being chased by tax people all over the place. Goodness. Well, um, I guess I'll move to just real quick. Hero and the Terror. Chuck Norris is just, I, I think he's an underrated actor myself. I, I, I like working with Chuck. We had a good time. And uh, was it a conscious decision to not have your character speak in that movie? Or? It was the, the character, the type of character that it was, you know. I'll tell you a funny story. I was, I had my, my wife from England was over watching me work. And I walked and we were in the garage and I walked up this, I was joking with her and stuff. And, and I got up to do a scene and I walked up this garage ramp and turned around and came back and came down as as uh, as the character. And I come down through the scene and she said, I don't think I could ever sleep with you again. <laughs> she said, how do you do that? How do you change like that? I said, that's what they paid me for. You know? Yeah, I remember you had like some yellow teeth and it was, it was, uh, snarling. But, but the, the, of course, they had to make you very kind of scary in order to be a good, formidable opponent against Chuck Norris, right? Body mold. I had a body padded mold underneath of me and stuff, and it was uh, to make me look bigger. Right. And then I guess they what they must have dropped the dummy of you at the end of that when you're falling through yeah, the ceiling. Yeah, fell through this thing. Yeah. We, that was an effective shot. I, I mean, because I was like, is that really him? Because <laughs> it looks it looks so real. Yeah, it worked really well. I mean, the fight scenes he and I did, are, we did them. You know, we choreographed it and did them and worked out pretty. It was, it was not, it was a very good film, I thought. Did he ever, uh, what, did he ever accidentally give you a hit or, or you? Uh, did you guys manage to not hurt each other in those fights no we didn't no we 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 had i respected him a lot and he respected me a lot worked out very well he seems like a just a really really awesome guy i mean super guy chuck is really a nice man he's a he's a i was very lucky he worked with a lot of very good talented actors did dragnet help you get that leading role that title role in that movie or no, they, um, you know, they, it's a, here's the fun part. They did, you know, like they do screenings, pre-screenings, and they had people fill out cards as to uh-huh. why did you come to see this movie and all that stuff. And, and 85% of the people said they came to see the movie because I was in it, which was kind of a nice stroke, actually. I, I remember renting that movie because you he was fighting you in it. Because I was like, well, shoot, I want to see Chuck Norris versus Bud. <laughs> uh, and you were in King Kong. But we had, uh, doing, we had fun doing Dragnet. I mean, Danny Aykroyd, if you saw Dragnet 50 times, you would not get all the one liners that Danny Aykroyd did. He had an earpiece in his ear of Jack, of Jack Webb. He was <laughs> listening to him all the time. It's all it's all built on that one final joke that if it didn't work, uh, the the Virgin Connie swell and he looks over and it goes da da da. <laughs> That's a classic uh, ending to that movie. But you, you in that movie, you seem to be doing a lot different. You uh, a, a lot of a, a, a more animated performance, almost like you're a cartoon character or something. Was that intentional? You know yeah, what I mean? You know, they just they, I, I I said you know here's Abel Muzz now. I got to take this guy and. I'm not going to play him like the rest of these hooligans. I'm going to do bring out his own personality. 
you know? Mm hmm. And it worked you, out pretty good. You had a very different look in that. Were you trying to separate yourself from Zod a little bit? Or non, I should say? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I. Yeah. I, Every film I did, I just took the character and became that person. I learned that from Mitchell. Yeah, well, hey, you learn from the best. Um, but anyway, it's just great watching you growing up all these years and seeing you move into writing books. Wh what would you like to tell us about Family Legacy? And uh, from what I understand, you were working on a, a, a series of books. Yeah, I've got two more coming out. We're we're we're. We were going to do a movie, and then I said, you know, there's just too much information uh, to put in one film, you know? Right. So I think we're going to do a miniseries, and we're we're talking to uh, National Amusement, which is a huge corporation that owns Paramount and NBC and a few other goodies, and they, they love the idea. I to tell the truth about a lot of things that happened in the country, and, and, uh, and the book uh starts off with my father and, and the assassination of my father and uh and I, then i tell the truth about the kennedy assassination it definitely sounds like a, an epic book that covers a lot of history and covers it from a kind of a different angle than probably what's what's out there these days Athlete, actor, author, Jack O'Halloran, family legacy. Jack Pagano has always felt he is different, smart and physically talented. The normal pursuits of youth, women and sports have always come a little too easy to him and left him unfulfilled. At age 17, Jack is eager to leave high school and begin his college career. But the schooling that lies ahead of him is of a far different variety than he could have ever imagined. Albert Anastasia, the notorious leader of Murder Incorporated, appears and claims Pagano as his son. But before Jack can make heads or tails of his newfound father, Anastasia is gunned down at the Park Sheridan Hotel. Under the tutelage of his late father's associates, Mayor Lansky and Frank Costello, Jack enters a world where crime and politics, money and murder, and the American way of life are all but a hand's breadth apart and inextricably linked. At the same time, another father is grooming his son to further his plans. Joseph Kennedy, the patriarch of what will become America's ruling dynasty, has set his sights on the White House. And with the help of some old friends in Chicago, his son, also, Jack will rise to power. Family Legacy by Jack O'Halloran. Available now on Amazon and wherever books are sold. You've lived a fascinating life. You've, you've not pulled any punches that's for sure just as as we wrap up gosh i appreciate you being so generous with your time i'm uh, really appreciative um uh, is there anything we haven't covered or anything that you'd like to share with anyone that's listening okay. uh, i know people are going to love family legacy when it comes out as a series or a film even if they make a film and they do sequels to it i still rather see it come out as a miniseries and cover everything and then take it into a series. Um, well, you've got you've got a website. I'll put in the description familylegacythenovel.com. Yep. I'll also link the book on Amazon, and uh, I'm going to link also all the movies that we talked about. I'm going to put them in the link is in the uh, description as well, so everyone can experience uh, all these great films that 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 you've made. And uh, again, I just really appreciate you being so generous. And uh, you, I, I see you out there talking with so many people in the community that have enjoyed your, your movies and your, your, your book. And uh, it's just great that you're so giving of yourself. And 
uh, I, I really have enjoyed talking with you and I, and I thank you and I, I hope you'll stay in touch with me and I'll be sure to send you a link of the, the video when I'm finished with it. Um, it's over two hours at this point. I might have to make a few uh, <laughs> snips here and there, but uh, but we had so much fun talking. I might have to, you know, truncate a little bit. You were the terror in here on the terror, but you're actually an American hero. And I thank you sincerely. You take care and have a good day. Just uh, keep me informed about what you're doing. And we'll do this again sometime. Definitely, definitely. Hopefully when the, the series gets picked up or your next book comes out or whatever project comes down the line, you're, you'll always be welcome to, uh, to chat with me, sir. And I thank you. And I wish you and your family well, and, and you take care. Take care, Mike. Be well. Thanks, sir. Bye-bye.